Yeah, so the question was whether there was uh, equivalent to uh, the, the, theory, the idea in the United States that uh, restricting spending in a political campaign is equivalent to restricting freedom of speech, whether that concept applies in Canadian discourse and law as well. The, the short answer is no. Uh, there are, in, in Canadian campaigns, there are some fairly strict laws around donations and how much political parties can spend, how much political candidates can spend. Uh, in fact, uh, um, not in our last election, but in the, in the previous federal election, there was uh, what, had, what became known as the in and out scandal as some financial shenanigans by, uh, by one of the major federal parties uh, was a violation of these rules by shuffling spending from one region to uh, another where they had they were safe, they believe they were safe in seat to another uh, uh, to another candidate, to another candidate, where they felt it was in more jeopardy. So uh, the argument that restricting spending on a, uh, on a political campaign is tantamount to restricting freedom of speech or freedom of expression is not an argument that has been made or has been seriously entertained in Canadian political culture. Yeah, and I know that that's quite different than a recent ruling in the United States. I, it's just a comment. I think the, the interpretation of what expression is in Canada is extremely broad. Almost, any, I think it would be found to be expression that's that's properly limited, because they, they, the courts have interpreted expression can be can be anything with the way you park your car. So I think that you spend would be called something a way you are expressing yourself, but. It's yeah. always under section one. It's always whether this is a proper limitation. Right. So it's not whether it's expression or not, but whether there's a, whether it's whether the right to spend unlimited funds exists because of the right to free expression, and that that has not been seriously challenged to date. I'm interested uh, about free speech. I'm interested in um, your position or positions on, um, for example, I 100% support the freedom of expression of ideas. I'm not so sure about the freedom of expression of hatred. So, um, like, be, below, uh, you know, threats of injury or requests of violence, for example, is, well, incitement to violence, let's say, um, you know, somebody expressing hatred of a group, um, to me that might still result in incitement to violence down the road. Uh, so I'm wondering what your views are on the difference between uh, just expressions against a certain group or just who they are versus ideas, which, you know, like I say, I fully support uh, unfettered freedom to express ideas, like anti-religious ideas and so on. But I'm just not 100% sure of the effects. Like if you just openly express hatred, say, to blacks or whatever. Um, you know, like recently I saw Levant on his news station openly expressed hatred towards Romas. Um, you know, based, I think, on some kind of misconception in Europe about Romas. Um, so I'm wondering about your views on that kind of thing. Thanks. Before you walk away, uh, just, did Ezra Levant say, I hate Romans? What did he say exactly? Um, I'm not sure what he said. I don't remember exactly, but he said something pretty derogatory about Romans in general. That's my point, is who, who decides if the line's been crossed? Government gets to decide that? You get to decide that? I get to decide that? I don't want to decide that. I don't want anybody else deciding that. Um, so... He probably didn't say, I hate Romas. He probably said something else that you're interpreting to mean that he hates Romas. Well, I might not interpret it the same way. I don't know whose interpretation is right. I'm not sure if one is right or wrong. Um, and I'm not sure who decides where that line is drawn. I Get back to my earlier point. I like the distinction between the Human Rights Commission's definition of uh, curtailing free speech or the way in which they do it versus uh, I, I like the, the criminal code's uh, definition better than the Human Rights Commission, because to your point about this idea of indirectly inciting hatred, anything anybody says could be used by a uh, warped individual to uh, incite them to do any number of, of activities um, that might be connected very indirectly to the original uh, speech. 
So the way the criminal code works is that your remarks have to clearly be directing uh, uh, violence, have to be clearly inciting immediate violence. Um, in the in the human rights case, though, it's more that it creates an atmosphere of hatred or um, not even hatred that they use the word. I forget what the word is, but it's kind of disrespect or slander or what have you. That then years later could be potentially connected with some act of violence, and it's, it could be quite hard to show that there in fact is that connection. Anybody else want to take a stab at this? I would say that uh, I support limited and well-crafted laws limiting freedom of expression where incitement to violence is concerned. I want to stress the limited and, and well-crafted. Uh, I am not a parliamentarian or a lawyer, and I will leave the crafting of the specific laws to uh, uh, to our elected officials, hopefully with input from uh, leading lights in the area, like Alan Borafoy, founder of the uh, CCLA, Canadian Civil Liberties Association, and the interpretation of whatever laws are passed uh, to the courts. So uh, I, I don't want to personally make a, a judgment on a particular event. Uh, I think that there need to be such restrictions. I think they're important. I think that they should have narrow application. Uh, two things. Um, what do you think about the suppression of science reporting that's happening in Canada right now? That's one. Oh, well, that's easy. I think it's horrible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, on a number of reasons. One is uh, one is personal and philosophical. This is a suppression of of truth. We've got someone that's figured something out about the world. Whether whatever it happens to be, we've taken the measurements, we've done an experiment, we've learned something, and that's not being communicated. So just right there is that's that's a problem. Secondly, that this is being done by by uh, by a government that amounts to censorship. That's a second that's a secondary secondary uh, reason that I find it deplorable. And then finally, this is being done by publicly funded research. So, I, in a sense, I have a personal stake, not an emotional one, but a personal uh, financial stake in that. So, my tax dollars are, in part, uh, paying for the equipment and the salaries and the time and everything else, which is which is fine. And I, as a Canadian citizen, as well as a citizen of the world, am being denied the benefit of those findings. So, there are many levels on which I find the muzzling of Canadian scientists to be uh, offensive wrong-headed and, uh, and deplorable. Okay, and do you know why they're doing this to us? I have suspicions. Do you care to share those suspicions? Uh, I, 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 I think that it is uh, consistent with the current federal conservative party's desire to control communications to the public. I, I I, I wish that uh, the opposition, Stephen Harper, was our prime minister when he decried quite accurately at the time the unprecedented consolidation of power in the prime minister's office under Jean Chrétien. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and that was a completely accurate observation, and I, I actually I, I agreed that that was potentially worrisome. However, we then got, uh, uh, I think it was the same Stephen Harper as prime minister, uh, which made the consolidation of, of uh, control within the prime minister's office uh, he took that to a far greater level than we experienced under under Mr. Krechian. I think that uh, I think that his the desire of the Federal Conservative Party for every public utterance to be on message and consistent with party uh, yeah, ideology uh, is uh, means that well scientists don't report their findings based on how consistent they are with previous public, public statements of politicians. They say, actually, the concentration of a particular gas is X, or the thickness of the ice caps in the Arctic is Y. Well, not because they care about the impact on the oil sands, but because they've taken the measurements, and those are the facts. I don't think that's, again, 
I'm speculating here. I don't think that it's so much an anti-science platform as such, as it is we must control the image of the that our uh, that our government has in uh, in the media, and anything that threatens to disrupt that image must be controlled. If that if federal scientists uh, threaten to disrupt that image, then appropriate steps must be taken. But all of this is speculation, and must be taken to that, and must must be viewed as a personal opinion. And I understand. More. I understand. Yes. Um, okay. The other ones. Uh, did you have? Did no, you want I'm just going to go in that I think it's consistent with um, other curtailing of evidence gathering, like uh, the, uh, the end to the mandatory long form census, the uh, attacks on the statisticians and Stats Canada leading to at least one or more of them uh, resigning from their positions and taking a very strong line against the government and uh, making the long-form census uh, voluntary so that we get less useful data, um, curtailing the uh, authorities of the uh, statisticians at Stats Canada leading to at least one or more of them, maybe a couple of them at this point, having, having resigned and uh, releasing statements about the kind of atmosphere that Statistics Canada was, was put into under this government, um, and just showing a real attitude of dismissal of evidence, data, statistics, in favor of, as we've said a few times, uh, ideology, the party line. I think it is consistent. Do you have another question? Um, question, comment? Um, so, again, about free speech, um, a few followed Reddit's ordeal over the last couple of months, uh, specifically, um, I guess because I'm talking about free speech, but in terms of internet content, which is also not just speech, but video and pictures and stuff like that. So Reddit, which is just like an online forum, had these sub-forums, um, and one of them was called Creep Shots, which is just people are taking pictures of, usually women, in awkward situations without them knowing, and then posting it online. Um, I think that it's been taken off now, but there was quite a big debate about whether or not the owners of Reddit should let that go, or if there's a, if there's an issue with that. Do you know what I'm trying to get at here? Does that make sense at all? This is the first time I've heard of Reddit, so I can't, I'm not sure I can comment intelligently. Really? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess I'll have to try. Um, yeah, I'm not that familiar with Reddit. I, I use it, I've seen it. Um, and I'm definitely not familiar with this particular incident that you're... I can be a little bit more specific. Oh yeah, please go on. We're talking about men taking pictures, sometimes of underage girls, mm -hmm. or even just, okay. you know, ladies who are maybe you know, bump shots or cleavage shots without them knowing and then posting it online for other creeps to comment on it. On it. There's sort of a violation there of yeah, privacy for, I mean, of some they're, kind. Are, they're not promoting ideas. Like, they're this not. Is just really okay, sexual so you wouldn't put that with the Or it would fall under probably a few sections of the criminal code even. I don't see that as, as being really connected. I, I think most of what we were getting at was the free exchange of ideas. Okay. And so where the ideas might uh, to get to like Mike's point and others might cross the line to promoting hate against a group, however often ill-defined that group is. But you're talking about particular people who are being, um, you know, who are being it's, violated in a way. It's pretty much like thousands of pictures, so it's yeah. not one. Oh, no, I know, but each picture is a violation against uh, a particular person, okay, so rather than an idea, uh, or, a, or rather than a general idea that might be put out into the public square for, for like, consideration. Her question was that. Did Reddit have any responsibility with regards to that? I guess if they're providing a, a forum for that kind of... Yeah, they're the owner. Yeah, they're providing the platform. Yeah, then I guess... Well, I mean, uh, what, what, what would you say to, to Google, for example, or other search engines that provide access to content? Is Reddit kind of like that, or is Reddit it more is directly like responsible user, for the content? Uh, it's user-generated. Right. It would be kind of like YouTube in a way, but pictures. Like in this instance, it'd be kind of like YouTube, but instead of videos, it's a whole bunch of pictures. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, maybe this this might be a good discussion topic because I, I, you know, I'm not sure. I don't know much about this issue, so I'm not sure I really have uh, a clear answer to give you. But I think others might have points. Maybe uh, Mike or. I think you described it basically uh, in a sense the forum or like 
it could be Reddit, but it could be other websites. Uh, I'm thinking YouTube was mentioned. Uh, you know, they have some responsibilities. So um, YouTube, they 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 have limits to what you can post as content. So you make content, but if you're filming a erotica or something like that, you throw it on there. They they have some limits. So I would imagine uh, imagine that it's similar with with Reddit. At some point, there's a line that you can't cross. Like, um, let's say post. I'm, I'm just gonna say posting uh, pictures of underage girls. You know, the, at some point, it crossed the line, and uh, it could touch um, uh, regional or inter international laws. I mean, I'm not sure there there are rules. Yeah, but like, say we ignore the underage, which is clearly a criminal offense, and you're a you're being like Reddit would be seen as the distributor of criminal material at that there's, stage. If you just want to be on the like, same age, like there's age another women. website. That is, I don't, I don't remember exactly the name, but it's called something like uh, "People at Walmart." Oh, man. Uh, the people at Walmart. Of people at Walmart. So it, it, it's sure. just like people kind of like walking around taking pictures of funny-looking people, you know, anybody at Walmart, and they just kind of post it, which is kind of a sort of a violation of, of you know, people's privacy, but. I guess my thing in the end was that when there was a big discussion online about what, whether or not this was ethical or if we should be taking it off or if not, a lot of people who were defending creep shots were throwing free speech out there, and I wasn't sure if that was even applicable to it, so that's probably, it probably totally isn't at all. It's a matter of something else, the ethics and morals, as opposed to just free speech. Yeah, like I'm, I'm kind of struggling to come up with a coherent response that encapsulates the different perspectives. It's a complicated question. I feel like intuitively it's wrong. Like emotionally, I think it's disgusting. But I'm trying to find a way to frame that in a, in a manner that's consistent with my, my other views as expressed in my speech. And, and, um, and struggling a little bit, to be honest. But, but I'll turn, so I'll turn it back to the, to the group here. And anyways, this is to motivate discussion. And to Leslie, who's putting his hand up to me. But what about like online bullying? Because you know we're taking a strong stand against well, online bullying that could lead to suicide or all sorts of, and that's exactly a good example of that. Yeah, no, I so hara uh, online harassment, online bullying, that kind of uh, uh, you know the the photo uh, the photos on Reddit. Um, well, Leslie, go ahead. So some of those that that post. Um, are also uh, the, the people that actually make the post that sometimes they're kids. On, on Reddit, there's a lot of... Facebook pictures or something that'll be reposted and they don't put on the same posters are the, oh, the posters A lot are... of people on Reddit, there, there's a bunch of, of teens there. Uh, it seems to be that everyone on Reddit is about 12. Uh, agreed, seriously. Um, I, I think what you're getting into there is like, Reddit's a private organization that hosts a site. So um, it can have its own terms of use. Like so YouTube will have terms of use that says we are not going to accept any triple X material. Where there there are other sites like YouTube that have no problem with that. Right? So YouTube or Reddit, if they have, uh, for example, anti-discrimination policies, part of their terms of use, can ban these things. But they probably don't have that. And they probably don't care, right? Because they, they might they, they want to say this is a completely open marketplace of ideas. We're not going to worry about discrimination or offending people, right? But now the question is, is this actually rising to something that is more harmful than just offending people, right? Is this child pornography? So if there's a child, a photo of a child, is that child pornography? And there are criminal laws that are will prevent that. That's a little bit more cut. Right, but if, if you just have a picture of a clothed child, I think depending on the country, but certainly in this country, if it was considered child pornography, it would need to be pulled, but just a picture of a child is not necessarily... You need more than that to get to pornography. And so it, it's a very complicated issue. Is it bullying? It, it might be more difficult to say that it's bullying because to get there, you need kind of an intentional uh, pattern of harassment intended to harm the person rather than to share this image with other people for them to get off on. Yeah, so it's it's controversial. Place, 
It, it can certainly escalate that way, right? Finds out that that's you know. So so then we have to ask. Well, then should the state be censoring Reddit? Reddit right? That would be the free speech issue here. Should we pass a law that says you can't have material on the internet that may bully somebody, uh, which is not necessarily the same thing as intimidating to harm them, right? You might. It's a it's a pretty high threshold to utter threats to intimidate under the criminal code. Um, we could have a lower, which is something like what the Canadian Human Rights Act has. It has this prohibition in telecommunications from hate speech or, or or harmful speech that is not really imminently threatening physical harm to anyone. So the, the reality is it's probably not illegal, uh, definitely not in the United States. But in Canada, it might fall under this, this human rights code if you could say, for example, that it was... Uh, discriminatory against women, but you got to get in there, <laughs> get that complaint in before that's well, revealed. If it's under the jurisdiction, if it's like the server or wherever it's hosted, or you know, yeah, if it's in Canada, it would be under the jurisdiction. You can't even write Thank you. <laughs> this is more a, um, a request or a suggestion, maybe. Uh, we we documented charities and uh, what so much dollars per pet taxpayer and so on, uh, how much the separate school is costing us billions and so on. But, you know, when I'm driving home tonight, I'm going to drive by five or six churches that are tax-free. What I would love to see on our, our site is somebody, if we could, is to quantify that. Quantify it and then put it on the web saying, for every Canadian, this is costing us 50, 60, 100 bucks every year. Who knows? But I'd like to see that quantified so people would know. Because right now, it's a freebie for them. Yeah, and in fact, the Canadian Secular Alliance has done uh, that analysis. I only had 15 minutes, so I didn't want to get into everything that we've done. But we have looked at uh, not just the charitable exemptions, but also to income taxes for ecclesiastical sal salaries and property taxes for uh, houses of worship uh, that are largely exempt. And the uh, numerous deductions that... Uh, those involved in, in working for a house of worship can make that they're not available to other nonprofit organizations, other corporations, or other citizens. And uh, the numbers are, are, are staggering. It's, it's tough to uh, get accurate uh, national numbers because in some cases we're able to get uh, a full province. In some cases we'd have to contact every single municipality to get those uh, to get that information. In some cases we were able to, we were emailed a large database or spreadsheet. In some cases, it would be uh, the equivalent of a Freedom of Information Act with filing charges of up, up to hundreds of dollars for not necessarily a lot of information, but our estimates are that it, it does run into the billions of dollars per year if you take into account all of the various uh, exemptions. And you can find a lot of this data on secularalliance.ca. Okay, I didn't know that. That's, you should advertise that more. We'll, we'll, we'll with do our it. new website, we will. <laughs> <laughs> Raise enough money to pay for that. Anyway, <laughs> well, the new website emphasized the point that CFI is a charitable organization. Of course. And you think religious people might be offended by that? <laughs> of course. Don't you Some think it's a slippery slope there? So that we're an educational charity. Um, they can do what they uh, yeah, try to talk about. It's educate people. Well, you know, and it's, it's very difficult, and what I'm saying it's difficult to craft an argument that targets only. Religions and not but, groups like us. But you have you have a large number of charities that declare, they self declare, saying they do no education, they do no relief of poverty, they do nothing that courts generally deem to be charitable. Right. All they do is proselytization. Yes, now, if, declare, if that provision. We declare that we're educational, but we spend ninety percent of our time talking to religion. But there's more. Yeah. Well, that's the taxpayer to pay for it. Yeah, we're going to have to decide. They are for everyone. If that's the case. It's just possible. Just warning that, that this, that, you know, this could be backlash. No, no, we have to There's usually backlash, but but uh, it, 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 this, just, I mean, we'll, we'll confront the backlash if and when we get it. If we get backlash, it probably means we're, we're doing something right. Um, but it's, it, it just isn't the case that 90% of what we do is attacking attacking religion. Not 90% of maybe the media we get is related to atheist advocacy 
Um, but that is a that is a sampling bias in terms of looking at the actual investments that we put into. And I'm not just defending CFI, but most of the humanist groups. This is true. Largely do uh, genuine educational work. They're just lower profile. But if it ever came to a legal battle, we could certainly show budgets that justify that much of what we do is putting on lectures, providing social services, and et cetera, et cetera. So we'd be we'd be okay, I think. But uh, but fair enough. Yeah, it's good to be aware of that possible that threat or attack against us. Any other questions? We have about uh, eight minutes to go. Um, I think uh, Laura, I saw your hand first. It's, it's just a comment on what the chaplain said here. Um, Leslie's point is, um, as long as you are following your mandates, you can do even the CRA rules. So if the church's mandate is simply advancing religion, they can do that. But our mandate as a body is larger, and as a consequence, we have to do more with less money. So we do have a harder you know, road to fight, but if we, as Leslie suggested, fight against religions having the charitable designation, then their mandate is out the window. So it's about really doing something for people. And we're educating people, too. This is how much it's costing you. <laughs> yeah. Well, that is a fair way to frame it, and that's, that is exactly how we do it. Any other uh, thoughts or questions? Oh, yeah, sorry. Go ahead. So, uh, yes, and you heard this before, uh, that people mind. Secularism seems to mean different thing uh, in whatever context we discuss it. Uh, and one of the things is when we're talking about government, when we're talking about secularization, we're talking about making sure that there is no religious undertone to decisions made, made in the government. But CFI is also a secular organization. And that means that we're not an atheistic organization. We're a secular organization. We have secular values that we we are promoting. By at the same time, aligning ourselves together with other secular organizations, like secular Jews, secular Christians, we get a better platform for for working uh, against, uh, towards the secular government. And at the same time, we're not anti-religious. That means that we also get the platform to stand on when it comes to attacking uh, charitable st status for religious organizations that has no other mandate than to promote religion. Yeah, you know, uh, maybe uh, well, either of you, but uh, Leslie, we, we used to have those debates in the CSA. Remember in the early days, of exactly along the lines you're referring to, is you know, should the CSA position itself as a a secular umbrella for? Secular Christians, Jews, Muslims, all of whom we do work with on particular causes. For example, it's too bad Gary's left, but the one school system network that he chairs uh, is composed of secular, rel religious, but secular liberal type groups. Um, uh, versus uh, whether CSA, at least, should frame itself as really interested in secularism, but on behalf of atheists and, and humanists. That was kind of the way the debate was uh, was framed. Um, do you want to elaborate a bit on that? Because it was a fairly Sure. Profound debate, at least for the CSA. Yeah. So there was a bit of a founder bias at the very beginning that it should be the voice for atheists, agnostics, free thinkers, etc. Uh, and after much discussion, realized that we came to the conclusion that that's uh, a very narrow view and that that would not be in the best interest of the long term uh, effectiveness of, of the organization. So uh, I would say that a majority of the Secular Alliance members do not hold deep religious beliefs. There is a minority of members that, that do because they agree with the principles that we do espouse, which is government neutrality in matters of religion. And uh, we've been very careful in the Secular Alliance not to um, advocate against religious expression in any way, but merely against government support for suppression of religious expression. So if you, people can do on their own time and on their own dime what they please, but they should not be censored or subsidized by by any level of government for that, so that uh, you want to found a, a religious organization, there should be no impediments put upon you, but neither should there be extra benefits. No, but I, I was talking one step higher to what, what C if I do. I told them what C is. Okay, C I, C I do. Uh, 
I'm here as a representative of the uh, Secular Alliance yeah. uh, Center. I'm, I'm a volunteer for the Center for Inquiry, but I can't, I can't really speak on, on behalf of that organization. I guess that's um, so I, I guess the, the approach is kind of similar because uh, the CFI, if anything, has an even more, you know, widely defined mandate. It isn't just promoting church state issues, which, as Leslie um, was was quite right in in, uh, in explaining, is a project that could be equally compelling to religious believers or atheists because it is neutrality. So C, CFI takes the same generally speaking, the same position on secularism. It doesn't mean that we're not uncompromising in our commitment to a neutral public square, as I was explaining. We, we firmly believe in that, but we don't think that believing in a neutral public square, one that isn't biased in favor of atheists or believers, can't be a compelling direction to move our society in for religious individuals too. It just so happens it seems to be of more interest as a project to, to atheists and non-believers. But philosophically, uh, and on principle, we think that it could be uh, compelling to to all parties. But then, CF, so CFI does that too. But then, on top of that, there's the there's the educational mandate, which or that is largely what we do. And I don't see why you know religious people might not our events on string theory or uh, even Larry's talk on evolution. Like these are science talks. They're what, my political talks. <laughs> not, not every yeah, absolutely. Not every religious person is a crazy creationist. Um, but we do have uh, from time to time people that attend events. Really, you because can't see why religious people might not be interested. <laughs> maybe you are the wrong example to use in my line of sight. Oh, so, so. Uh, that would be a good example. Yeah, sure. Um, lo- much of the educational series that we host, I'd like to think would be of interest to moderate, at least moderate, religious people. So if we're looking to make a larger tent, as I guess is your, your point, to be more effective, then I think we, we just have to be more cognizant, I think, of the way in which we present our topics and do it in a more diplomatic, friendly way. Um, maybe there are some interesting lessons there to be had, but I don't think the subject matter debates on religion, philosophy, politics, that, that that's the problem. No, I, I, that's not my issue. Uh, if I don't remember wrong, we've had it in, in some of our uh, promotional material where it says promote atheism. Um, well, that's, that is an interesting sort of question of, of PR. Um, I would not describe CFI as promoting atheism, but I would say is it defends atheism. It does defend people's right to be an atheist. That's, a, that's an important distinction. I don't see CFI as an atheist organization. It is an a- it is an organization, though, for atheists, but it's also an organization for other people. Um, and why? Because there are not a lot of places uh, where atheists can join nonprofits and feel comfortable that their services, their community outreach, their multimedia projects, their educational events are, will be friendly to them, uh, will be of interest to them. So it is an organization that I think atheists gravitate to, and I would define it as as focused on or at its core an atheist organization. Because as I was saying, I think much of the projects and activities we do would also be of interest to non-atheists. Just out of curiosity, how many associate members and members of the board do you think are non-atheists? Well, I would hesitate to speak for them on their personal beliefs. What would be your guess? <laughs> Probably very few. Would it be zero? Uh, well, I'm no, I, I don't... You have I, a hard time defending that point of view to any lawyer well, not a, it's hardly a legal question. I think that um, among the the <laughs> board the members, uh, and among the board members and the advisors and the membership, there is a wide difference of opinion in terms of where people fall on on the religious question. Um, the, 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 that spectrum may be a a subset of the larger spectrum of the populace, but they're not all. You know, what is it on the Dawkins scale, like ten, uh, nine point nine, or something? Atheist. You know what I'm getting at. Uh, so, so there are debates about um, epistemological debates, but even between atheists, which which you well know. So, I don't think we're do- dogmatically committed to any particular position on religion, on politics, on science. Um, maybe we can do more to to in- increase the size of that spectrum. Um, but as an educational charity, look, we have to be committed to being open and of interest to to the public generally. It's how we keep our charitable status. As Leslie can can tell you, it's got to be a public benefit. Not just of atheist benefit, and that's where our commitment is. Uh, maybe there's time for like one quick last question. Last track of the time here. Anybody else? 
Okay. Anybody on the panel want to get in the last word? Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thanks.